Today's tutorial will show you how to make a slab and how to add pieces of clay and carve pieces of clay to create a finished work of art showing additive and subtractive hand building techniques. You will need kiln fired clay or you can do this with some air dry clay and I'll put my favorite air dry clay in the description box. And you will need a variety of different clay tools. I'll put all my materials and my favorite tools in the description box and you'll also need a container to make slip so that you can score slip and blend your favorite pieces. This tutorial will cover all the basics so it's great for beginners, intermediate and advanced artists. If you love learning about art, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an art tutorial. Starting out, I'm wedging a big piece of clay to roll a slab. When making slabs, I find to use more clay works best. You don't want to roll a slab that's too thin. I am wedging my clay onto my canvas tabletop because it's larger than handheld. So I'm making sure that my clay is one consistent piece, getting out the air pockets, and I'm going to be working it into a flat form. Once you've wedged your clay, take your hands, and I like to call this the hamburger patty step. You are not making a round sphere, you are making a flattish shape that's not too thin because you'll be using a rolling pin. So to me, it looks like country fried steak or a hamburger patty, and yes, I always do the food references. Now I'm using my rolling pin, and I'm gonna roll two or three directions, flip it, and then roll more directions. So if you keep rolling the same way, your slab will only extend the shape it already is. I'm trying to get mine rounder, so you can see I'm kind of holding it up, and I'm letting the clay work its way to more of a round shape. So roll, roll, then I flip, and you wanna keep doing that so it doesn't stick to your tabletop or your canvas. With slab making, you don't want it too thin, you don't want it too thick, and I'll show you a ruler to kind of gauge how big it is. Um, so I'm rolling again, kind of rolling one direction, two, three, four, five times or so, and then I will flip it and try it from a different direction. This is making my clay flat, it's making it consistent, just don't make it too thin. The best thing you can do is roll your clay again, wedge it, make another slab if you think it's gonna be too thin. I would like my clay tile to be a circle. So I'm using the styrofoam plate and the shish kebab stick to cut a circular shape out of my slab. Make sure that you do this in the center of your slab so that your edge doesn't slope down and get too thin. I'm pulling my plate here. Then I'm gonna take my extra clay, which isn't trash. I'm gonna wedge that all together and I can use it for other details. And then look at the thickness of my clay. I would say the goal would be about half an inch and you want it to be pretty even all the way around. So I'm using a ruler, but the more you make slabs, the more you kind of get used to it. A little too thick in this point is better than a little too thin. Then I'm gonna take a paintbrush with a little bit of water. You don't wanna overdo it. And I'm just rounding out my edges since I rough cut it with my shish kebab stick. You can also use a needle tool, but they're really nice and kind of dangerous. So I usually hide those for my students. You can also take a sponge and smooth your surface and smooth your edges so that you have a really nice slab to work with when you're adding and carving your designs. You can start working on it right away or if you need to store it. I like to lay it on a thin piece of cardboard or cardstock, depending on what I have on hand so that the moisture dries evenly. The paper or cardboard will pull the moisture and allow it to dry flat. And then you can wrap it in a bag. I really like the gallon Ziploc storage bags because that allows for it to dry flat. It's easy, um, it's easy to stack and to put away if you're doing this in a classroom setting and it just keeps things nice and flat. Next, it's time to start the additive process of adding clay using the score, slip, and blend method. Sketching out and planning your ideas is a really great place to start. And so I'm using my shish kebab stick just to kind of divide my clay in an abstract shape. I'm going to be freehanding this a little bit. My theme or the design of my clay is going to be very abstract shapes, playing around with textures. That's the great thing about this technique. This is a relief sculpture, which is when three dimensional elements are carved into or attached to a flat surface. And in the past, it was usually a wall or a part of a building. For us, it's going to be this piece of tile. And this is great for beginners because if you're new to working three dimensionally, it is laying flat. Keep in mind this tile would like be put against a wall, hung up and looked at, so it's flat, but it also has areas that are coming out of it. 
What I'm doing now is taking a scrap of tile that I have. I actually made two of these tiles, and I'm going to create abstract shapes that I'm going to score, slip, and blend, and attach as the first part of my relief sculpture. This is a very important part of the design. You want balance. Um, you don't want to just have like one small random shape attached to your clay. I recommend when anytime you're doing a composition, whether it's three-dimensional or just a drawing or 2D like a painting, I recommend using a variety of big, medium, and small shapes. Taking up most of your space while having some blank areas is key. And you can see I don't have a really strong design. I'm just kind of mapping and planning it out as I go. Again, this is a piece of um, slab that I've cut into these smaller pieces. So if you need to know how to make a slab, start the video over and watch that. It doesn't have to be as big as the first one I did. It can be very small pieces. Just make sure they're not too thin. When you score, slip, and blend these to your clay, you want it to raise up enough. Now, it's still laying flat to the surface and that's key. It's not jutting out randomly or awkwardly. That would be weird to look at visually, but also it would be dangerous because the more clay sticks off the background that it's attached to, where the surface it's attached to, the quicker it dries and the more fragile it is. Another option is to make coils. So if you're tired of cutting shapes out of slabs, you can roll little coils with pieces of clay. These are decorative, so they don't have to be a certain thickness. They can be as thin or as thick as you would like. And by as thick, I would say if it's much thicker than your thumb, it's gonna take forever to dry. So I'm just making little coils that I can then add to my clay as part of my design. If you've ever made little snakes out of Play-Doh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this gives you just a different type of additive technique. The slabs are great, they kind of match the style, but then the coils, you can really make more organic shapes and really play around um, with sizes of your coils as well. I recommend doing a combination of both so you have an eye-catching design with lots of different points of interest. Once you have your design planned out, it's time to score, slip, and blend every single raised surface to your clay. There is no shortcut, especially when you're adding clay that has two different levels of dryness. And I'm using a variety of tools. This plastic green tool is okay. It has a ridge edge so you can see the score marks that I'm creating. Let me zoom in. And this tool will work okay because because it's a flat slab on top of a flat slab. I prefer to use a fork, a needle tool, or one of those shish kebab skewers when attaching clay. And I'll show you a variety of different tools to use. Okay, you put score marks on the piece and the surface that you are attaching the piece to. I'm being a little bit sloppy, but I have a big space to work with. So you can see my score marks are opening up both clay surfaces. Next, you add slip, which is a combination of clay and water. If you've never made slip before, click the link above and I will walk you through my step-by-step -step easy guide for the classroom. Slip is like the glue. It is going to fuse together the two clay surfaces getting in the cracks and crevices of your score marks. You will press, and then depending on what the shape of your clay that you're adding is, you want to blend, so score, slip, and blend. And since this is a slab, I'm using my flat tool. And again, all my tools that I love to use in my classroom are in the materials box. And I'm gonna go around the shape and blending it to the clay itself. The goal here is you want to erase all of the score marks so it's not sloppy and kind of slide the tool around to make sure that it's really stuck on there. We'll repeat these same steps. Score, slip, and blend for every piece you add to your clay, no matter how big or small. I'm repeating using this green tool for this large section, but I'll show you a couple different tools for smaller pieces. You could use a fork, a needle tool, a shish kebab stick, anything with an edge that's gonna open up and create sport score marks in your clay. So the score marks open up to the two separate clay bodies, the slip goes in between, and then when you press and blend, you should have a seamlessly indestructible piece of clay as long as it's flat and you let it dry slowly. I did pick up the pace a little bit in this video, so if you think I'm hustling and moving a little faster, I am. Um, and you can see I did the same thing with the coil score marks on both surfaces, where you're attaching the clay and the piece of clay that you are attaching. With the same wooden tool, you can go around and really make sure that it's blended, erasing your score marks. And I recommend doing this step-by-step step so you're not overwhelmed with a ton of like really messy additions. That can get very overwhelming. Don't forget, one of the best tools that you have are your hands. So if your space allows, get in there with your fingers, do some smoothing, push things around until you're happy with your overall effect. It's not gonna look nice and neat now. This is like building a house, the dust hasn't settled, there's trash everywhere, it's very unfinished. But this is the building process. You're building and adding your pieces of clay and then we'll spend a lot of time refining it. 
Since I am repeating my steps using the exact same tools, I'm gonna double time this, and if it looks like I'm going fast, yes, I'm going double the speed. So if you're watching this and you're confused, I recommend pausing it, going back, looking at the sections, because this is just a repeat of the same technique. Score, slip, and blend. That is your additive techniques, how to attach different pieces of clay, whether they're slabs, coils, or they're hand-modeled pieces. The next thing I'm gonna show you is this tiny little coil in the top little edge there. I'm gonna show you a different tool to use to attach that small little area. Let's zoom ahead. So if you're thinking that there's pieces that you didn't watch me score, slip, and blend, I edited out some of it because this video was about an hour long, and I know my students don't have time for that. So I'm taking my small baby little coil here, and I'm mapping out where I want it to go, and it changes like every second. I'm really doing a rough cut here. This is a very rough section of scoring, and that gives me a little flexibility if I change the shape a little bit. As long as it's in the scored area, it's A-OK. -okay. Now I'm gonna use that shish kebab stick I talk about, and I like this one for fine lines and details. You're gonna see me do this a lot when I am doing the carving that we're gonna talk about next. I'm still putting score marks. Let me zoom in. And it's important even with small pieces to find a balance of enough scoring. So you don't want such a gentle little mark that slip can barely get in there, but not being too aggressive that it's so deep that it cuts and breaks your pieces. And that just takes time and practice. And then I'm gonna put slip on the surface cause I put a lot. And then I'm just kind of making up the shape that I want this to go. Could have I planned this out a little bit better? Of course, but I'm just rolling with it, trying to show the basic techniques forget to blend your edges and really make it one with the slab that you've created. Sometimes students think the small pieces don't need to be scored, slip, and blended. The only thing holding these things together right now is moisture. So once this becomes dry, and it has to be bone dry before you put it in the kiln, there will be nothing holding these two pieces of clay together. So the score, slip, and blend method is unavoidable even for tiny little pieces like this. I'm gonna speed things up to a time lapse as I add all of my final additive elements. Remember, if you're watching this, pause it, rewind it, find the places where you need review, but this is simply me repeating the same steps over and over again. Now that I have everything added, it's time for my subtractive or carving techniques. Let's zoom in. There are so many different tools you can use to carve or create subtracted or receded areas in your clay. My favorite is this ribbon or loop tool. It makes this satisfying shape. It curls the clay like pieces of chocolate or shavings of wood. And I get obsessive and I could carve all day until my clay completely disappears. The thing with, with this tool is once it's gone, it's gone. So don't get too carve happy like sometimes I tend to do. This loop or ribbon tool also does a really great job flattening flat areas on your tile and edges of slab that you've carved. You're gonna see me use this tool a lot. It's really addictive, it's great for cleaning up, and it's great for creating large areas. Now, smaller areas of carving, I'll show you a variety of different tools to use for that as well, the shish kebab stick being my favorite. The beauty of this technique is think of it almost like drawing or a two-dimensional work of art. Yes, you have these added or raised surfaces, but you can also create designs and drawings in your clay that go in slightly. What you see me doing now is procrastinating. I did not create a design or a sketch like I made my students do during class, so I'm kind of cleaning up and trimming edges and working on my details and craftsmanship before I really focus in on my carved areas because I'm not positive exactly how I want this to look. I know I want it abstract. I know I want different shapes. Of course, I need to use additive and subtractive techniques, but my overall vision is kind of happening as I go. If you work that way too, that's fine, but I'm sure your art teacher, if you're doing this in class, it's probably gonna make you sketch something out. And to be honest, it definitely helps the flow of work. One thing I am realizing is that my clay is a little messy, especially in the background. So I'm using my sponge to smooth out my textures. Smooth is just one texture, but I feel like I kind of have this messy background to do my drawings, my carvings, my subtractive techniques. And so a sponge will really help me feel kind of organized before I get started. Okay, let's do this. I'm using the handle of my paintbrush to create these nice round areas that recede into the top layer of my clay. And again, my style here is just abstract. I love these circles. I feel like that's organized in this like sea of chaos. And you can use your slip brush to kind of smooth out your surfaces. Now I'm using my shish kebab skewer to carve and draw some areas. Um, and I really like that this kind of mimics the coils that I added to my clay. 
You'll notice when carving into clay, the clay has to go somewhere. So there's little crispies that I'm pulling with the clay. Get in the habit of kind of taking your finger and pulling them away. You can add them to your slip container. You can smooth them down. That is just the reality of carving into clay. They will be there. They will be annoying. I call them little crispies. You get into the habit and the hang of kind of cleaning up as you go. But anytime you push something down into clay, the clay has to react and go somewhere. So get used to it, make friends with the crispies, figure out your way to deal with it because they're gonna be there anytime you're using carving tools. Back to my favorite carving tool, the ribbon or loop tool. And you can see I have this little pile of shavings I'm putting in my slip and putting next to my clay. Nothing is trash. All clay can be repurposed, reclaimed, claimed, and recycled. So make sure you're saving your little pieces. And if you get overwhelmed putting it in one slip container, make a little scrap pile off to the side. It can be put in a bag, dried out, or recycled that day. I'm just carving kind of random lines here. I'm very comfortable with clay. I've worked with it since I was a kid. I've been teaching it for 13 years. So I do encourage my students to map out and sketch. And I even have them label like the additive areas, the clay they're gonna add, and the carved areas or the clay they're gonna subtract away. So depending on your level, depending on your comfort level with the tools and your experience, I say you have a plan, map it out, um, because then you won't be left kind of randomly carving and wondering what the game plan is. So this fun moment I'm having over here is the same dots as before, except I got real close to the edge. So I press and like pull the dot towards the edge to make this like wavy scallop vibe. I really like how it looks. It is kind of dangerous because I felt like I was about to break the edge of my clay, but the slab was thick enough that it worked. Just like with the additive techniques, how much carving really depends on you, but I would stay away from tons of blank space unless it's very purposeful. You want to take up, I would say 75% of your clay with either layers of 3D or carve lines, textures, patterns, and designs. I'm using my paintbrush here because I have a lot of carving but I really want some smooth areas too. So finding a balance of textures versus smooth areas, 3D versus carved, and not having too much blank space on your tile. That will help your composition just look really neat, organized, and purposeful, and not boring or bland to look at. You can see I'm using the ribbon tool again to really straighten up my edges. I'm at the stage where I'm being very particular about my textures, my straight lines and edges. This is the point of the project where I feel like I've added a lot and sure I might add and change, but the bulk of adding and carving has really been done and now I'm focusing more on detail work, craftsmanship, and just the particulars of each shape. This video was originally over two hours, so you'll see sometimes I write double time or a time lapse, or I might cut certain things out altogether in this video if it's a lot of repetition. What you see me doing now is just adding a little bit more texture and designs. I feel like the additive or the layers of my clay are a little dominant over the carved areas. I'm a person that loves texture. I love carving into clay. I think it looks good. I think it's fun to do. So I'm repeating the shapes I like, like those little circles, and I'm just playing around with adding other areas. Because this is a small surface, sometimes it is hard to get in those like nooks and crannies and cracks and crevices. Um, but just work with the tools you have and experiment with ones that you might like more. How do you know when you're done? When you feel like your clay is balanced with your 3D and your carved areas. When you feel like you've really smoothed out the rough spots and you've really made sure your texture is intentional. When most of your space is taken up with designs and you don't have a lot of negative space or space that is empty. There's nothing wrong with some blank areas, but I'm talking about like lots of it. So once you have found a stopping point for the day or even for the week, you're going to put it back in the bag every time you're done working with it. Like I said before, as the clay dries, you'll find there's tools that you can use and there's easier ways to kind of deal with it. I do love this paintbrush and the sponge to smooth things out and I know I'll continue working on this another day. Let's wrap this thing up for now. I laid my clay out on top of the bag so that it could dry slowly but with the bag on top and open. So you can see that the clay has dried significantly and I'm using this large brush to dust off any crispies. This clay is past leather hard. It is a small piece of clay. Remember I did set it outside the bag. The bag was on top of it so it would dry slowly. Then I removed it and it sat a couple hours just out. You can see that parts of it, especially the raised areas are much lighter. Those are becoming pretty dry and then the area on the back is still carvable. Be careful carving into clay as it dries. Clay has silica in it. It's not good to breathe it in. If you have asthma, it's even worse. So in this stage, you might wanna wear a mask or just be careful with your dried areas. 
I'm gonna carve my name in the back with my trusty shish kebab stick. Yes, you can see the cardstock kind of stuck to the back. You can carve that off with a large ribbon tool or it will also burn off in the kiln. You just don't wanna lose or put that much in there. So I'm putting Machado 2021, dusting it off with my brush and I think I'm done. Could I add more? Sure, but I think it has a good balance of additive and subtractive techniques. Thank you so much for sticking around and making art with me. And if you're interested in a whole bunch more of my clay tutorials, check these out and also check my description box for all of my clay tutorials. If you're interested in what my students are up to in the classroom, find me on Instagram at thatartteacher underscore Machado.